Here we'll find a formula that will let you quickly add the numbers from 1 to n. Let's start off by writing the series that adds the numbers from 1 to n. How can you rewrite this series in sigma notation? The kth term here, or a sub k, is just equal to k. Because when k is 1, we get 1. When k is 2, it's 2. k is 3, it's 3, and 4, and so on. Now we want to add these up. So we want to add up k. And the first term that we want to include is when k equals 1. That corresponds to this. And the last term we want to include is when k is equal to n. So this is how we write it in sigma notation. Right, and you can read this as the sum of k from k equals 1 to n. Suppose n is equal to 5. What's the sum of the whole numbers from 1 to 5? The sum of the numbers from 1 to 5 is just 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5, which, well, we can say it's 5 plus 1, which is 6, 4 plus 2 is 6, and then we're left for the 3, so that's 15. Yes, this sum is equal to 15. But if we choose a bigger n, adding the numbers can become nearly impossible. For example, what's the sum of the numbers from 1 to 500? You could add up all 500 numbers. Instead, let's try to find a faster way, a formula, for adding the numbers from 1 to n. We'll arrive at our formula using a picture. Let's draw a few circles for every number in this sum. For the number 1, we'll draw one circle. For the number 2, two circles. For 3, three circles. For 4, four circles. All the way to n, for which we'll draw n circles. In the case that we've drawn here, n is equal to 9, but this explanation works for any value of n. So the number of yellow circles here is equal to the sum up here. Next question. How many rows are there in this picture? This is not a trick question. How many rows are there? Well, they're sort of counted for us already. This is the first row. It's 2, 3, 4, and here we have the nth row, so they are n rows. Right, there are n rows here, numbered from 1 to n. Next, let's make a copy of all those circles, and rotate it by 180 degrees. We now have a rectangle of circles. How many columns are there in this rectangle, in terms of n? How many columns are there? Well, let's call this the first column, second one. And if we keep going, we get up to the nth column. But then there's one more here. That's the n plus first column. So there's actually n plus one columns in this picture. Yes, there are n plus one columns. If you look at the bottom row, there are n yellow circles, and then one more orange circle over here, giving us n plus 1 columns in total. How many circles of any color are there in this rectangle? To find the total number of circles, we can just take the number of rows, which is n, and multiply it by the number of columns, which is n plus 1. So the total number of circles in this picture is just n, times n plus 1. Right, it's n times n plus 1. Now what fraction of the circles in this rectangle are yellow? The red circles were just a copy of the yellow circles, so there are just as many red circles as yellow circles. If there are just as many red circles as yellow circles, the yellow circles are half of the total number.
correct. Half are yellow and half are orange. That means the total number of yellow circles, which is the same as this sum up here, is n times n plus 1 over 2. And that's it. Now we have a formula for adding up the numbers from 1 to n. It equals n times n plus 1 over 2. Let's rewrite the series using sigma notation. And at this point, let's check our formula to make sure it works. Earlier, you found the sum of the numbers from 1 to 5 equals 15. Let's see if we get the same answer using our new formula. n represents the largest number in the sum, which is 5 here. 5 plus 1 is 6, and 5 times 6 is 30. 30 over 2 equals 15, so yes, the formula has given us the correct answer. Finally, try taking another stab at adding the whole numbers from 1 to 500 using this formula. We can just use this formula here. The one thing we have to figure out is what big N is. Big N is the number on top of the summation sign, or the biggest number being added. In this case, big N is 500. So the sum of the numbers from 1 to 500 is 500 times 500 plus 1, all divided by 2. 500 divided by 2 is 250, and 500 plus 1 is 501. We can calculate that using our calculator. It's 250 times 501, and that gives us 125,250. and the third term is 4 more than the second. Here we'll find a formula for adding up arithmetic series. Here's an example of what we call an arithmetic sequence. Do you see a pattern here? If we look at the first two terms here, we see that the second is 4 more than the first, and the third term is 4 more than the second. Every term here is 4 more than the previous term. This is an arithmetic sequence where you always add the same number when going from one term to the next. An arithmetic series is the sum of an arithmetic sequence. Which of the following choices is another example of an arithmetic series? Let's start by looking at the first series. 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8. The difference between the first two terms is 1, the difference between the second two terms is 2, and then the difference here is 4. Because those differences aren't constant, this is not an arithmetic series. Let's take a look at the second sequence, or the second series. There we have 1 plus 3 plus 6 plus 10, and so on. The difference between the first two terms is 2, the difference here is 3, and the difference here is 4. Now the differences are, seem to be increasing by a constant amount, but the differences themselves aren't constant, so that's also not an arithmetic series. Okay, let's look at the third one. It's 1, minus 4, minus 9, minus 14. So, the difference between these two terms is minus 4 minus 1, which is minus 5. The difference here is also minus 5, and the difference here is minus 5 again. So that's looking pretty promising. Okay, so this looked pretty promising. Let's just check the last one for completeness. It's minus 3, minus 8, minus 11, minus 18. The difference between those two terms is minus 5, the difference here is minus 3, and the difference here is minus 7. Those aren't constant, so that's no good either. The only one that seems to work is the third one.
Now let's try to find the sum of this arithmetic series. We could try to add up all the terms by hand, but there's a trick that can save us a lot of time, especially when the list of numbers we're adding becomes very long. Let's call the sum we're trying to find S. Now let's rewrite the sum backwards underneath it. And now let's add these two equations together, column by column. On the left, S plus S is 2S. The next column is 7 plus 27, which is 34. The next column, 11 plus 23, is also 34. So is the next, and the next, and the next. Why is that? Well, the top row always increases by 4, and the bottom row always decreases by 4. So the sum turns out to be the same for every column. So now 2s is the sum of these six different 34s. So 2s equals 6 times 34. Dividing both sides by 2, we see that s equals 6 times 34 over 2. To come up with a more general formula, let's figure out where these numbers, 6 and 34, came from. 6 was the number of terms, which we'll call big N. 34 came from 7 plus 27, which is the sum of the first and last terms. If we call the first term A1 and the last term AN, our formula now looks like this. This last formula is very useful because it works for any arithmetic series. Now try using this formula to find the sum of a longer series. In order to use this formula, we need to find big N, the number of terms, A sub 1, the first term, and A sub N, the last term. The first term is 3, and the last term is 78. In order to find big N, we need to look in the middle of the sequence. Notice that there's a jump of 5 between every set of terms. There's a jump of 5 there, a jump of 5 there, another jump of 5 here, and so on, up to 78. If we could figure out how many jumps there were, we could figure out how many terms there were. How many jumps are there? Well, the difference between 78 and 3 is 75, and every jump has a size of 5, so let's divide by that to find the number of jumps. This gives us 75 over 5, which is 15. So there's 15 jumps. Now the first jump takes us from 3 to 8, from the first term to the second term. So this is the 15th jump here, because we said there's 15 total jumps. That's going to go from the 15th term to the 16th term. So this is actually a sub 16. That means there's 16 total terms, and that gives us enough information to use our formula. So the sum is going to be n, which is 16, times a sub 1, which is 3, plus a sub n, which is 78, all divided by 2. 16 divided by 2 is 8, and 3 plus 78 is 81. If we use our calculator, we get 8 times 81 is 648. So that's our answer, 648. To find the sum of any arithmetic series, you need to figure out how many terms are in your sum and what the first and last terms are. Then you can multiply n, the number of terms, by the average of the first and last terms. As you saw in that last problem, sometimes you have to do a little work to find the number of terms. In other problems, you might have to work to find the last term. But no matter what, once you have these three pieces of information, the number of terms, the first term, and the last term, you can quickly find the sum of an arithmetic series. In this tutorial, we'll introduce geometric series. First, here's an example of a geometric series. 1 plus 3 plus 9 plus 27 plus 81. To get the next term in a geometric series, you always multiply the previous term by a fixed number. What's that number for this series here?
Okay, so to get from 1 to 3, we multiplied by 3. And to get from 3 to 9, we multiplied by 3 again. And from 9 to 27, multiply by 3, and 27 to 81, multiply by 3. So each number here is a factor of 3 more than the previous number. So the answer looks like it's 3. Right, it's 3. You'll usually see this number, which is the ratio between consecutive terms in this series, indicated with the letter R. Now note that the first term, 1, equals 3 to the 0th power. The next term was 3 to the 1st power, then 3 squared, cubed, and to the 4th. What's the sum of this geometric series? Well, this question is asking us to add a bunch of numbers, so let's use the calculator. We want 1 plus 3 plus 9 plus 27 plus 81, and that's 121. Okay. Exactly. It's 121. And 121 also happens to equal 3 to the 5th, 5 is one more than the highest power of 3 in the sum, minus 1 over 3 minus 1. You'll see where this formula came from in a minute. Let's try to come up with a formula for the sum of any geometric series. You can write every geometric series like this. a plus ar plus ar squared plus ar cubed and so on up to a times r to the n. r is the ratio between consecutive terms, which was 3 for the earlier example you saw and a is the value of the first term. n is the highest power of r that appears in the geometric series. Let's say that the sum of this series is equal to a number x, and so now we want to solve for x for any values of a, r, and n. Now let's move some things around in this equation. First off, let's subtract a from both sides. Next, let's divide both sides by r. When dividing the right side by r, x minus a becomes the numerator, and r is the denominator. When dividing the left side by r, we can cancel out an r from each term in this sum. So ar becomes a, ar squared becomes ar, ar cubed becomes ar squared, and so on. And ar to the n becomes ar to the n minus 1. Finally, let's add ar to the n to both sides. Now. Does the left side of this new equation look familiar? What's an equivalent expression for the left side of this equation? Well, let's see here. We have a plus ar plus ar squared and so on up to a times r to the n. Well, we see the same geometric series up here. It's a plus ar plus ar squared and so on up to a times r to the n. So these two expressions here are the same. So this expression, this sum here, is also equal to x. Yes, these two expressions highlighted in yellow are the same. So this sum here is equal to x. Now we have an equation relating x, a, r, and n. a, r, and n were the numbers that describe the geometric series, and x is what we've been trying to solve for. It's the sum of the geometric series. So can you solve this equation for x? Okay, so we want to solve this equation for x. Let's start out by multiplying everything by r, so we move the r out of that denominator. So the left side is r times x equals x minus a, and when we multiply this last term by r, we get additional a times r to the n plus 1. Okay, now we want to solve this for x, so let's first move some things around. Let's add a to both sides. We have a plus r to the x, and we've gotten rid of the minus a over here. And let's subtract rx from both sides. So we got rid of the rx here. Now we have all the x's on one side. And let's move this term, a times r to the n plus 1, over to the left side. So we'll subtract a times r to the n plus 1 get rid of this term. Okay, so now the left-hand side is a, we can factor that out, 
times 1 minus r to the n plus 1. And the right-hand side is x, which we can factor out, times 1 minus r. So your goal here is to solve for this x. Maybe you can divide both sides by 1 minus r. Great. x equals a times 1 minus r to the n plus 1 over 1 minus r. Let's try applying this formula to a geometric series. What's the sum of 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth and so on up to 1 over 1024? The denominators in this series are powers of 2 up to 1024. Okay, so we want the sum of this series. To get that, we're going to need to know a, r, and n. a is the first term in the series, so a here equals 1. r is the ratio between the terms, and in this series, each term is half the previous one, so r equals 1 half. And now we need n, which is the highest power of the ratio. So in this case, we have 1 plus 1 half to the first power plus 1 half to the second power, this last term, 1 over 1024, that's equal to 1 half to the tenth power. So n is 10. So given that a is 1, r is a half, and n is 10, try plugging these numbers into this expression for the sum of the geometric series and see what you get. Okay, so we said for this geometric series that a is 1, r is a half, and n is 10. So let's try using this formula for the sum of a geometric series. We said a is 1, and we're multiplying it by 1 minus r, which is a half, raised to the n plus 1 power. n is 10, so n plus 1 is 11, and we're dividing this by 1 minus r, or 1 minus a half. So to find this, we're multiplying a fraction by 1, so we can get rid of the 1. And now this is equal to 1 minus 1 half to the 11th power is 1 over 2048, and we're dividing that by 1 minus a half, which equals a half. This is equal to 2047 over 2048, and we're dividing that by a half. When you divide by a fraction, it's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal, or the flipped version of that fraction. So this is equal to 2047 over 2048 times 2. And then this is equal to 2047 over 1024. Let's try using the calculator to see what that's equal to. We have 2047 divided by 1024. It's about 1.999. So this sum is equal to about 1.999. Yes, the sum of this series is 2047 over 1024. For this series, a was 1, r was a half, and n was 10. So the sum turned out to be 2047 over 1024, and in decimal form, that's about 1.999, which is suspiciously close to 2. In a later tutorial, we'll look at what happens when the geometric series doesn't end, but instead goes on forever. For this series, that would mean that 1 over 1024 is not the last term, but that there are infinitely many terms after it, and we're adding all of them up together. This is then an example of an infinite geometric series. Maybe this one adds up to 2. Try thinking about it for a bit. Here we'll talk about summing up different powers. But let's start with a question. What's the sum from k equals 1 to n of 1? So for this sum, we're adding up n different terms. The first term is 1. The second term is 1. They're all 1. The third term is 1. The fourth term is 1, and so on. And the last term is 1. And we have n terms. 
So n different ones add up to n. Right. This was the same thing as adding up n different copies of the number 1, which sums up to n. Next, do you remember the formula for adding up the numbers from 1 to n? Okay, well, if you forgot the formula, let's figure it out again. If n equals 1, then you're adding up the first 1 number, which is just 1. If n equals 2, then you have 1 plus 2, which equals 3. If n equals 3, then we have 1 plus 2 plus 3, which equals 6. And if n equals 4, that's 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, which equals 10. So for these values of n, these are the sums of the first n numbers. Which of these formulas gives you these sums? Right, it's n times n plus 1 over 2. Which of the following is an equivalent way to write this polynomial? Let's find another way to write this polynomial. Let's expand the numerator. n times n plus 1, well, we can distribute the n into the n plus 1. So that's equal to n times n, which is n squared plus n. So this is equal to n squared plus n over 2, which is equal to 1 half n squared plus 1 half n. Right. This is the same thing as 1 half n squared plus 1 half n. You'll see in a little bit why we're rewriting the sum like this. Now, which of the following is the sum of the first n squares? Try plugging in a few different values for n to see which formula gives you the right answer. Okay, let's plug in a few values. So if n equals 1, then we have the sum of the first 1 squares, which is 1. If n equals 2, then we have 1 squared plus 2 squared, which equals 5. If n equals 3, we have 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, so that'll be 5 plus another 3 squared, which is 14. If n equals 4, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared plus 4 squared, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, we just said, is 14. And 4 squared is another 16, so this equals 30. Okay, so these are the sums of the first few squares. Which of these formulas gives you the right result? Exactly. The sum of the first n squares turns out to be n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, all over 6. Again, What's an equivalent expression for this polynomial? Let's do the multiplication. We have n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1, all divided by 6. Let's start by multiplying the two terms in parentheses here. We'll leave the n over 6 out front. If we take n times 2n, we get 2n squared. If we take that n again and multiply it by 1, we get plus n. But if we add that to the term that we get by taking this 1 and multiplying it by 2n, we're going to get 2n from those two and n from before, so that's 3n. And finally, if we take this 1 at the end and multiply it by this 1 at the end, we're going to get plus 1. Now we can distribute the n over 6 inside. n over 6 times 2n squared gives us the 1 third from the 2 divided by 6 and an n cubed from the n times n squared. n over 6 times 3n is going to give us the 1 half from the 3 over 6 and an n squared from the n times n. And finally, n over 6 times 1 is just 1 sixth n. That looks exactly like this answer here. Right, it's equal to 1 third n cubed plus 1 half n squared plus 1 sixth n. At this point, let's just rewrite a few things. 
This k over here, we can rewrite as k to the first power. Great. And let's also rewrite this one up here as k to the zeroth power, which we can do since any number to the zeroth power is one. Okay. At this point, you might notice a pattern in these formulas on the right. Try using the pattern to guess which the following is the formula for the sum of the first n cubes. Do you see the pattern here? When we add up the first n squares, we have a 3 in the denominator and a 3 in the exponent for the leading term. When we're adding up k to the first power, we have a 2 in the denominator and a 2 in the exponent. And we can rewrite this n as 1 over 1 times n to the first. So the zeroth power gives us a 1 in the denominator and a 1 in the exponent. So the first term in the polynomial over here, if we have a 3 over here, we're adding up the cubes, we'd expect to have 1 over 4 times n to the fourth, plus some other terms. So which one of these choices here has a leading term or a first term that's 1 over 4 n to the fourth? Exactly. The sum of the first n cubes equals 1 fourth n to the fourth plus 1 half n cubed plus 1 fourth n squared. Let's highlight the pattern you found. If you're summing up a certain power, then the highest power, or degree, of the sum is one more than that power. When adding up cubes, the degree of the result is 4. When adding up the first n squares, the degree of the sum is 3. And not only that, the leading coefficient, meaning the coefficient of the highest power, is 1 over that same power. Our formulas have 1 third n cubed, 1 half n squared, and so on. Suppose you're adding up the first n powers for a certain power p. Just as we did for squares and cubes, you could write this sum as a polynomial. What do you think the first term is for this polynomial? So when we added up the first n cubes, we had this expression. And we found that this was equal to 1 fourth n to the fourth power plus some other terms. And this 4 and this 4 were both 1 more than the 3 in the expression on the left. So we'd expect that when we have a p as this exponent, we'd expect the first term in the sum to be 1 over p plus 1 times n to the p plus 1 plus some other powers. Right, this sum is equal to 1 over p plus 1 times n to the p plus 1, plus the terms with lower powers.